Hello or moin, as we say here in northern Germany. Welcome once again to another instalment of Globe Going Digital. My name is John Goodyear, and I'm speaking to you from my home office here in Oldenburg. Joining me today is Julia Sommersberg, history teacher at the EGS, or the IGS in English, the EGS Flirtenteich in Oldenburg. Hello, Julia. Good afternoon, John, and hello, Elizabeth. Nice to see you. Sitting next to her is her daughter, Freda. Good day to you, Freda. Hi. Hi, Freda. And Freda is going to be helping us out with some questions later on in today's interview. Now, last September in 2019, the IGS, or the EGS in German, the IGS celebrated its 25th anniversary. But as Yuna's research discovered, the IGS Flirtentai is actually located on the site of the former Oldenburg Primary School, run by the British Families Education Service, BFES, the school being set up in the 1950s. So the IGS today, come to think of it, has the British Army to thank for the location of the school in the north of Oldenburg. Just a stone's throw away from the school is the Globe Cinema and Theatre on the former Donnerschwey Barracks, known in English as the Kreia Barracks. And this is, of course, the subject matter of my own research. Today, we have a special guest, Elizabeth Hughes, a then 11-year-old schoolgirl. Not only did she attend the primary school from January 1957 until the July of that year, she also went as an 11 year old to the Globe Cinema. Welcome to you, Elizabeth. Hello, John. Hello, Yuna. Hello, Frida. Uh, Elizabeth, where, where are you based? Where are you at the moment? I'm at my home in North Wales in Rill, where I've lived for nearly 50 years now. That's a long time, Elizabeth. It is considering how much we moved before in those, uh, before those 50 years. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to explain how this is going to uh, work today. So I'm going to start off by asking Elizabeth some questions about her early years and then Eula from the EGS with the help of Freda will get Elizabeth to recall some of her school memories and then it'll be back to me and I'll be talking to Elizabeth about the Globe Cinema. So let's get started, Elizabeth. Could you tell us your, your full name, your date of birth and where you were born? My name is Elizabeth Helen Hughes. I was born on the 23rd of August, 1946. And, um, and I live now in really North Wales. And whereabouts were you born, Elizabeth? In Colchester. Ah, Essex. right. And I lived there only for three weeks. I was moved up to York after that. Right. And what happened then after York? Your father, of course, in the army, you presumably yes. moved around. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, from York, when I was three, we went out to East Africa. And then my father got promotion, which meant he had to be moved to North Africa. And uh, then just before I started school at five, we came back to Britain. And we lived in, or oh, the we lived in Folkestone, Canterbury, and then Frinton on Sea, which is near Colchester. Before coming out to Germany when I was seven, um, and we spent four years in North Germany. Could you tell us exactly where you landed here in North Germany first, Elizabeth? I would assume because I never did any other route when I came back to Britain, and that would have been going um, Hook of Holland, Harwich, on the ferry. Never flew. Never okay, flew. Okay, so no flying. So always by yeah. boat and train? Always by boat and train. East Africa was boat and train. Troop, tra troop ships. Um, only, only my father was allowed to fly. The rest of us went with baggage. <laughs> uh, what are your recollections of this journey? Can you remember some of those early childhood memories of your journey over to Germany or was it just a distant past that's a bit of a fog? Well it's a bit of a distant past but we did it a few times visiting family and eventually coming back to school in September of uh, 57. Mm. So it, it was a train over to the Hook of Holland, never a car, we never took the car anywhere um, and then just a night passage to Harwich mm -hmm. and a train the other side either straight into London and out again or if it was in Essex itself, it would be um, 
or relatives picking us up from the from Harwich. So, so uh, yeah. So your primary school age when you get to uh, Germany, you said, did you say the age of seven there, Elizabeth? When yes. You first came? yes. Where, where were you first um, in Germany? Or where were you first in Germany? What, what town or what city? Can you remember? Yes, we lived in Ferden for three years, which was on the River Alla and near Hanover. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was in school there for three years in an army school in, the, in, in Ferden. Okay, and what were your experiences of this particular army school in Fjorden, presumably also run by the British uh, Families Education Service? Uh, yes, of course it was, yes. Um, it was a school, if I remember rightly, of about 100 children. There were four classes, two infants and two juniors, mm-hmm. um, and roughly 25 in a class, something like that. I remember the school layout quite well because I was there for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was an extremely good school because they, they really, they did wonders for me, put it that way. What do you remember doing at this school, Elizabeth, at the uh, BFES primary school in Fjorden? In Fjorden? Well, apart from ordinary uh, lessons, there was a lot of forestry around Fjorden, so we used to do a lot of uh, walking um, through the you know, forest, nature walks and things like that. Um, we also used to do art and and music, and in those um, <laughs> in those lessons, we had to we also had to learn a few German songs. Oh. Um, forever in my head is Mein Vater war ein Wundersmann, <laughs> und schwenken meinen Hut. I forget a little bit. <laughs> and Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, of course. Um, and Schlaf and Heilige Ruhe. Again, the middle bit got a bit mixed up somewhere. But um, uh, yes, and also um, we were always encouraged to do, just to learn basic German, so that when you went out into the shops, you know, you knew how to ask for something or to say, please, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, and those sort of, the, the basic polite things that you could do when you wanted to go out into town. You have very positive memories of your time in Fiat and Elizabeth. Were there any things that were perhaps not so positive that were negative? Um, not particularly, no. The, I mean, it was, a, it was a very surprising place to me. It was so different from anything I'd seen before. Mm. Um, for instance, we had we had a lovely house. The garage was in the cellar. I'd never seen a garage in a cellar before. <laughs> So you had to go dip right down, you know, to the underneath to drive in and out. The winters there were so cold. I'd not experienced that cold before. Really? Um, I thought it was brilliant because we were allowed to wear ski trousers to school. Well, in the 50s, no girl wore trousers ever. <laughs> and it was so warm to wear your ski trousers. But you, you hung them up in the, in, the, uh, in the cloakroom, of course. You didn't wear them into class. But um, I just thought that was just so brilliant having these. And it gave us a lot of freedom as well to go out sledging and these sort of activities that I'd never done before or experienced before. Amazing. So, um, yes, it was. And the forests around, even in summer with bicycles and, and that sort of thing, they were just an adventure playground. It was brilliant. Talking of the clothes that you wore, Elizabeth, did you have to wear a school uniform? This is something that obviously German school children know about the English school system, but we have here an English school in Germany. Did you have to wear as a primary school child? I think I did. Mm, I think I did. Um, But I wasn't, it was always fairly standard. It would just be a sort of uh, a gym slip, but it wouldn't usually be black or navy because... So many of us moved so much, it meant you could carry on wearing it at the next school. Mm -hmm. So they were all very basic colours. They didn't go in for these kind of uniforms that we have in Britain um, and with lots of different stripes on ties and things like that. But there was definitely a school wear. Okay, that's probably a nice way of uh, putting it, Elizabeth. And why were you, or why was your family... Um, in Fjorden, what, in other words, was the, the job, the role of your either father or mother? Well, uh, when you're an, an army padre, you're not, you're not attached permanently to a regiment. So my father would just be sent wherever it was needed. He went and, and worked with different regiments around, around the world. 
So um, why we got moved to Fairton, I don't know. I mean, it was just, that's where we were sent and that's where you went. You didn't question it. And there were two regiments in Fairton. There was uh, two lots of barracks. One, I think, was an artillery regiment because they had horses there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had their own swimming pool. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. And uh, the other barracks where the school and the cinema were, was um, the Seventh Army that had been in the North Africa campaign, Desert Rats. So you've got a lot of mobility, obviously, in, in the army, including your own father. So it was your father who was a, a padre. He was attached to the... Uh, to the British Army and was being yes. sent here, there and everywhere. So yes. up to this point, the point at which your time in Fiaden came to an end, you yourself had been uh, in, in Africa, in uh, the UK and also in Germany. Is that right? Yes, that's right. That's an amazing uh, story, travel story already at the age of 11. Well, I'd lived more abroad at the age of 11 than I had in, in Britain. Uh, but uh, there are disadvantages to that. I mean, it meant five primary schools. But okay. the, the advantages, I think, personally, far outweighed um, the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And I think the army schools were quite, they were well adapted to uh, having children who were so transient that um, you, you just had to get on with what you were given <laughs> as a teacher. <laughs> and then talking about getting on what you were given, you were then given another destination, another location when you were 11, after Fjarden, you moved here to Oldenburg. Yes, that was, a, that was a plea from my father because my sister, who you interviewed before, um, she had, to, had only two terms left to finish school. So he asked if he could stay in Germany so she could stay in her army boarding school up in Plön. Ah, so it's like um, a stopgap so measure. Almost. It was a stopgap measure, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And can you remember your initial impressions when you first got to Oldenburg? What were you feeling? What did you see? What can you remember? Not a huge amount. It seemed the town, if I remember rightly, seemed a lot bigger than Fairden. Um, it was perhaps more damaged after the war than Fairden because it wasn't so near to the ports, you see, wasn't it? Mm. Up in the north, quite near to the, um, to the North Sea. Um, and, but apart from that, I was used, we were used to seeing that kind of damage. I mean, I had grandparents who lived in the east end of London. Okay. So I was used to seeing a lot of, uh, say, war damage that had gone on. So that didn't surprise us, put it that way. But the actual town, we always had lovely places to live, I must say. The houses we lived in were really nice and very upmarket. We, we were never as upmarket in our housing in Britain as the Germans were. <laughs> they just had the most... Um, like the, I was saying about the garage and, and uh, the other half of it was central heating. My mother had never seen central heating before. We were just over the moon, just, it was, but then we, we haven't lived anywhere quite as cold before. Now, in today's interview, Elizabeth, because normally I do these interviews one-to-one, -one, but we, we have um, special interviewers, uh, yes. Elizabeth, and these special interviewers are Eula and her daughter, Freda, and they're going to pick up the interview now because they are here in Oldenburg, and yes. they also have this special connection, of course, to the school. So I'm going to pass over now to, uh, on the opposite side of uh, my screen, I'm going to pass over to, to Eula and Freda to ask their many questions that they have for you, Elizabeth. So it's over to you, Eula and Freda. Go, go, go. Great, I will. You've asked some questions already, but I've got some left. Um, I, um, I, I understand you were born after the war. and yes. you quite young when you came to Germany, but yes. you were 11 when you were here. So you must have had some consciousness about what had happened. Did you have any um, preconceptions about Germany and Germans in particular? Maybe? Not that I remember at the age of seven, because it was seven when I went out to Germany. And we mixed with quite a lot of German people in Ferden. Um, and I mean, we had a German maid, a lovely lady, and she had a daughter uh, similar to me. 
and but she lived on a farm with her parents so i used to go to the farm none of them spoke any any english so we all had to muddle along and get on as best as we could but children don't care about things like that do they you know as long as somebody knows what toy you want to play with and what to do who cares you know and uh, and so i have um I, you know, I didn't have any, yes, of course, we knew what had gone on, but my father actually hadn't been involved in the uh, European war. He was out in the Far East. He'd been out in, um, you know, in India and in Burma for, for three years. So we always knew his side of that, what was going on out there, rather than what had been going on in Germany as children. So... Uh, but it certainly wasn't anything that was taught in school or anything. But of course, you know the British, they had to have loads of war films afterwards. All through the 50s, there were these films coming, churning out year after year. So uh, we couldn't avoid it. Okay. Um, I have a question for actually. Um, I went to the EGS Flutenteich, which is the school now built on the grounds of the English elementary school. And I remember when I started school, not the EGS, but elementary school, school children in Germany get a great big cone made out of cardboard or construction paper filled with sweets. <laughs> they decorated really pretty as a present for starting school. And I was wondering if, because you started school in Germany, just not in a German school, if you got something like that, or if you remember if other children in these military schools got special sorts of presents or if there were any traditions um revolving around the whole starting of school thing no i don't actually remember anything for starting school all i remember when i started school which was actually in britain when i was five was having to line up in a, in a yard and do exercises before we were allowed in <laughs> but um no and also remember in the 50s when you came to a new school there was very little in the way of sweets and things like that. Everything was rationed very strictly. Um, very little spare food to go around anywhere. So you, you basically, I don't even remember eating sweets. So uh, um, until I was probably a bit older. Because um, there was rationing for food in Britain as well until 1954. So we still, I remember actually in one school, but this is again in Britain, was going with a coupon to, on a Friday when I was given a coupon to go to the sweet shop and take and buy something for school, to take to school. So okay. a Friday treat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you said before that you learned some basic German, so you could go into a shop and buy something. And were there shops it's, around here that you yes. remember? Um, not so much, no, I don't remember. Um, but I'm sure he did, you know, if there was something that we wanted, it wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have bothered me. I don't ever remember feeling um, frightened of anything, you know, that you, were, you didn't want to go and do anything. That would never occurred to me. But then the, the army children were kept very much on a, like a housing estate, really, so that we all played with each other. We all went to the same school. There was no big children around because they were all in boarding schools. So um, we were like, did what we wanted, really. Oh. Very free, you know. All right. So um, when I started researching on, on, on this matter, I went around and rang every doorbell in the neighborhood. Really, yes. every, every right. doorbell. <laughs> And there was nobody who remembered this school, which seems odd to me because it yes. was, I found the, the, the women who owned the property before the school was built. So I found them and I could talk to them, but they were the only ones, nothing else apart from this. Do you remember in Oldenburg any interactions with German children? You said in Faden you went out and mm. did sledging and whatever. Were there similar interactions around here? Not that I remember, no. Uh, whether it was because we were too close to the barracks or, or although we were in Ferdinand as well, but we're not on the barracks, but very close by. Um, but I don't remember. No, no, because we we had what we called brownies, which was before the girl guides. We had those sort of societies that we went to and, and took part in. But I don't remember ever 
no, not, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, but I don't remember mixing with uh, a lot of German children at the time there. No, okay. not in Oldenburg. Do you happen to remember certain subjects you took in the elementary school here in, Ger in Oldenburg? Or did you have a favorite subject? Um, I didn't have a favorite subject, but um, the only one thing that does stick out in my mind, and I think I mentioned it before, was um, there was a long corridor outside the classrooms and it was very very light there it was a lot of windows and we used to have sewing lessons in this corridor only the girls of course boys didn't do things like that and uh, we I remember learning to sew with cross stitch there making cross stitch and cross stitching a tulip on some material special embroidery material to make a belt and thinking I know I I don't know who's going to wear this belt because I'm not, you know. <laughs> don't, please don't make me wear this belt. And the other thing was, uh, in the process, we had to card, they called it carding wool, which was the raw wool from the sheep, put in between, sandwiched between two very fine brushes, like wire, they, the bristles were like br uh, wire. And then you stretch the wool out, so that it straightened and once it was straight we gave it to the teacher who had a spinning wheel and she then sort of did magic with this thing and we all just sat there and thought ah, okay fine yep what's next <laughs> okay and while we're on the subject of school subjects um yes. you mentioned before that in music class you did learn some german songs yes did, you, did the teachers actually teach you german lessons in school do you remember that not that I remember specifically German lessons. Um, I did have them once I got back to Britain, but that's, a, that's another story. I, I, I'll tell you one in a minute. It might, might horrify you a bit, actually. Um, my first secondary school, I didn't do German. Um, but then I went down to Plymouth and we, I was, it was like three tier classes. You either did Latin with French or you did German and French or you just did French. Well, I had done no Latin. So because we'd lived in Germany and I had a knowledge of German, but not, I, I'm not, wasn't fluent by any means. I was put into the German class. They'd already started, but the teacher happened to be German and she was very young. She'd married, I think, uh, um, an army, British army man after the war and she they came to live in Britain and she was lovely and she sort of came in and she looked and I looked at her and because she said we uh, heißen sie and I said ich heiße Elisabeth and she went oh, you answered me you know you actually answered me so I from then on she was you know she was very simple but it was very simple German but we we got on like a house one I loved my German lessons then I moved to another school in Reading and I was put in the German class. Uh, this is why I'm telling you the story. The lady was, you won't know, but John might have heard of the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Yes. Yeah. And she was, uh, it was a film with Maggie Smith, where she was a very far bear and up from Edinburgh. And she taught in a very posh school and this was quite posh. And this woman was just like that. And she taught German. And I came in and she started, and I started off like I'd always done in Plymouth. And after about two weeks, she said to me, I have a wee complaint here, Elizabeth. In this school, you keep talking in Plattdeutsch to me. And in this school, we do Hochdeutsch, which meant nothing to me, absolutely nothing. I didn't know what she was talking about. And from then on, she always corrected me if I pronounced anything in the wrong way. I suppose, John, it was like having a Geordie coming yeah. into a German school to learn English and talking, yeah, completely, you know, I don't know. But anyway, something like that. By the end of the year, I was such a nervous wreck, I gave it up. So... <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay, John dug up the school inspections report, which is very... Yes. Interesting. And the inspection report says um, that there was a close cooperation between the teachers and the parents' unit. Do you remember anything about this, like your mother maybe being involved in some school stuff? Not in school things. She was involved with the brownies. Um, she was a brown owl. 
but parents weren't usually in those days involved in school activities. It's okay. a, quite a recent thing, I think, with parents to be involved in schools. Uh, I would say from more or less the 80s, 1980s onwards. Um, but she was involved with youth clubs, those sorts of things for youth activities out of school. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was meant by, by, by this report, I, I don't know. Um, the report states many very modern stuff in this school, which really sounds like a school from the 80s in, in yes. the way it is described. Yes. You mentioned these crafts lessons, you don't know, maybe remember anything else? Like, like art lessons or, or... I do remember art lessons, yes, but again, we often went out then if it was nice weather to, to um, you know, to, to draw and, and do natural art, art things. But uh, I'm not very good at it, um, Eula, so I wasn't that interested. Okay. <laughs> my, my art is a bit of a joke in the family. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and do you happen to remember anything about how the building actually looked like? Because I, in my head, the EGS looks like it does now. And we even have a whole new wing that was built a few years ago. So I really can't imagine any other building standing there. And I really can't imagine how the British military school could have looked. Well, I'm, I'm looking, the, you, I had the plans here that you must have given John, was, did, or did John find them? And it looks, as I remember with this corridor, as if there was a junior wing for children from seven to 11 and an infant wing joined perhaps by communal hall or offices in the middle uh, where the small children would go, the five to seven year olds. Um, and all I remember then is just, it was just this corridor. It was very different to my previous school in Ferden. So um, we didn't have corridors and things like that. It was two separate buildings there. So that's all I remember is, is this very long corridor. Well, it seemed long to me then. It probably wasn't. Corridor with lots, I say, lots of windows. Um, and I, the design of it was somewhere. I, I had not seen a design like that before in any of the schools I'd been in. But uh, that's about as much as I can tell you. I'm very sorry. Um, since you just mentioned Ferden again, can you remember any differences in how you were taught between the Pferden school or the, and the Oldenburg school or were they fairly cohesive? Fairly similar because all these teachers were trained in Britain. They weren't army personnel. They were trained teachers from Britain who applied for work over, you know, in the uh, army schools. So it was all quite similar, the syllabus and quite similar the way they taught. Um, and it was all quite um, so, it was so different because I, I ended up being a primary school teacher. And it was just very much more regimented. Um, the, the way we had to write, because of course there was no computers or anything like that. So handwriting was very much um, a subject. That was taught separately. You know, we had to go in and, and do practice handwriting every day. One, that was one thing we did do, was we had special paper with three lines on with two red lines in the middle. And so if it was a tall letter, like an H or a B, had to go to the top line and the bottom, then the, a tail letter, like a G, had to go to the bottom line. It was very regimented like that when you were learned, when you to practice good handwriting. So that was something that we had to do nearly every day, a certain, something would be put on the board, you had to write out. Um, like times tables in mathematics was very, very much, um, there would be a big poster on the wall and for your times table from two to 12. Um, when, you, when you actually could go through the whole time without stopping and thinking, then you got a tick for that one. And then you moved on to the next one. So it was um, a lot of rote learning a lot of practice learning done rather than investigation or, or discovering things for yourself or um, and we didn't have homework that I remember in primary school we did in secondary school but I don't remember having homework in primary school for uh, I think they thought that's it you've done your bit you can go home now give us some peace <laughs> 
So, okay, I think we, we have heard quite a lot from you. You say you don't remember much, but you remember quite a lot and you were very enlightening to us. Good so you. I think I'll give it back to John. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Eula. You. Thank you, Eula. Uh, Thank you, Frida. Uh, we're still on the air, uh, Elizabeth. I've got a, a follow-up question with regards to this all important 11 plus. So for those um, people watching in, in Germany, who perhaps don't know uh, too much about the education system in the 1950s. Of course, this was the, the, the test, the exam that was taken by huge numbers of young people uh, in their lives. Many people still remember it in order to work out which school they would go to post primary school. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, can you remember anything about that process with you specifically, this 11 plus? Well, there was basically three papers you took. There was a maths paper, there was an English paper, and there was an intelligence paper. And that was for problem solving. And um, it was the sort of thing where you'd get, you know, the, the fox and the rabbit and you on one side of a river and you had to get them across where the fox wouldn't eat the rabbit. Like, those sort of things. But um, And um, so... Yeah, we just we used to practice them in school as well. Obviously, they were training you up for those those processes. How difficult they would be considered now, or how easy? I don't know. Compared to what I, I don't know about Germany, but in Britain they still have some sort of testing at eleven. But I'm, I wouldn't like to say whether it is easier or or more or harder. Can you remember, Elizabeth, doing this test here in Oldenburg or preparing for this test here in Oldenburg? And was it actually taken here at the Oldenburg Primary School? Yes, it would have been taken at the school, definitely. Uh, it was an external examination, so they'd all be sent off. Um, and I think there was a test called the Murray, M-O-R-A-Y, house test, mm -hmm. that we as uh, forces children were allowed to take particularly if we were abroad, but it was, I, I always got the impression it was slightly easier. They were, in other words, cutting us a bit of slack for having traveled around and perhaps missed out on a lot of schooling. So um, that, I think it was the Murray House test I took as distinct the Olympus, but it was treated in the same way um, when it came to deciding who went to grammar or who went to secondary modern schools. And of course, the army schools, they encompassed both. They were, they were not only co-educational, which was very unusual then uh, for secondary schools, but they, were, um, they had parallel secondary modern and grammar schools. They weren't comprehensive. They were definite. You, you could go from one to the other, but they were definite. You were in the grammar stream or the secondary stream, secondary modern. And that would be under uh, one roof, in other words. Yes. Well, Wait. under one school campus because they were at boarding school. So they had to, they accommodated all, all you know, all spectrums. I, that, that's quite a nice um, parallel. I'll, I'll ask you, Eula this. Eula, is this the same at the, at the EGS? Would you have uh, two, two streams? So you would have, uh, you know, Hauptschule and Realschule and as well gymnasium level under one roof, under an EGS system, is that right? The, the idea of the EGS is to have them in one classroom. So oh, to one classroom, all okay. Together, and after 10th grade, they do have an exam. And after this, they go out and learn a trade or they stay with us until they graduate. Okay. Until then, they are all together in yes. almost every lesson. Later on, there's courses, courses yeah. for math and German, but mostly they are together. Okay. Uh, right up to year 10? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and in year 8, you get split up into year 8, right? Yeah. You get split up into A and Nine. B. Nine? Nine. Nine. Okay, you get split up into a, 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 an advanced group and one group that's not as advanced. Okay, but so your group, they are grouped, yes. put into groups, yes. For certain subjects, you, PE, everybody takes together, yes. but German, okay. for example, is one of yes. the lessons. That's, that's like the comprehensive schooling we have here now. Because the grammar schools and the secondary modern schools, with the exception of a very, very few, they disappeared in the 1970s. Okay. Sticking with the uh, 11 plus, uh, Elizabeth, can you actively remember 
preparing for this examination, the reason why I asked this question is because there are, you know, some of those uh, schools in very few schools, of course, that have these a kind of emissions tests to get into the very few grammar schools that are left in uh, England and Wales. Mm. Um, but parents pay a lot of money for tuition and get their children to learn uh, for this test quite rigorously in order to stand a chance of getting into the grammar school. How was it with you in this 11 plus? Do you remember actually revising, learning, exam Yes, prep? I do, I do. Because my father, um, I announced to him when I was 10, that I was going to be, a, I wanted to be an infant school teacher. I wanted to teach that age group. So he told me, well, you can't go that if you don't get to grammar school, because you can't get enough geez, O levels and A levels and things. So um, he went to the headmaster at the time and um, explained to him his predicament, because he didn't think I'd going to make it. So uh, he gave him a book of old test papers and we had them at home. And apart from what we did in school, I used to spend three evenings on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday. My, ma my father would give me uh, like the maths paper on a Monday, English paper on a Wednesday and the intelligence test on the, on, on the Friday. Um, and then he'd mark them for me just so that I knew exactly what I was letting myself in for and to realize probably how stupid I was. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to improve, girl, if that's what you think you're going to do. <laughs> uh, uh, where did you need to improve, Elizabeth? Can you remember your father saying to you, this is where you need to improve? <laughs> uh, yes, I think it would have been my uh, English language writing and recording and uh, um, perhaps not reading, but certainly the written word. It's very, I've always said this, English is a very difficult language when it comes to writing. It's not difficult to speak, I don't think. But the written word for anybody who is not their mother tongue, and well, even if it is your mother tongue, <laughs> it's still it's still very very hard to do. I think. And how did spelling. he correct you, your father, uh, when it comes to things like spelling? I mean, can you remember what he used to do? Yes. Was it sort of the red yes, pen, or was it? Yes, yes. Um, when I first started, when I first started grammar school, it was a boarding school, and we had to write home every. Uh, every Every Sunday, there was a special set time where we all went into the library. There was 50 of us or we had places to sit in the dining room where we had to write a letter to mum and dad. And my father gave me, at the beginning of each term, a 10 shilling note which went into a tin at home. And he said, now do your best and any money that's left in the tin for the next holiday, you can have, but you will lose a hate me every time you make a spelling mistake in your letters what? going home. I very rarely had any money, <laughs> which meant that my average must have been about 10 spelling mm. mistakes a letter. Mm. And they wondered why the letters got shorter and shorter, <laughs> less information. <laughs> uh, so, uh, at boarding school, you're now obviously back in the UK, but where was father? Where, where was your dad? Was he still here in Germany or was he elsewhere? No, he got uh, sent to Plymouth in 1957, right. the end of 57, in this December. I never went back to Germany after coming back to Britain in the, in the okay. September of 57. Not for school, not to live. Um, we had to get the train down to Plymouth then. Yes. Staying in Oldenburg, Elizabeth, obviously, oh, we, oh, actually, Eula's got a hand up. This is very good. This is uh, very student-like. Go on, Eula. I'm very sorry, but no, my head teacher asked me to invite you. If you ever come around, she'd be happy to show you around <laughs> and to <laughs> oh, host you. And you and that's you. lovely. Well, my sister has already said to me, do you fancy doing a trip to Oldenburg with me? And I said, yes, of course, you know, anything. anything. I mean, you want to take me away somewhere I'm off? And, uh, and so, you know, we would, I would appreciate that um, because it would be a lovely thing to do if and when we get back, when we're allowed to travel again. Yes. Yeah, At the moment, absolutely. we have no idea when, when we will be allowed to travel. And, uh, and so, but yes, I appreciate that, Eula, very much. I'd love to meet you all. I'd love to come and see the school. Thank you. Great. And I can vouch for the uh, the hospitality that is bestowed to you when you go to uh, the Egos Flirt and Tyke. I was also privy to their 25th anniversary 
uh, back in September, which fell on my birthday, actually, on the 6th of September. They had this wonderful uh, celebration, which I uh, attended and, and saw all of the good work that they do there. So uh, I'm sure, Elizabeth, they'll put on a, a very nice welcoming committee for you and you'll be there received <laughs> with open arms at the EGS um, just around the corner from the uh, EGS, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, Elizabeth, it is the Globe Cinema and Theatre. Now, bearing in mind that you're an 11-year-old schoolgirl here in 1957, yes. ca can you actually remember uh, not just what you said about the Oldenburg Primary School, can you also remember anything about the Globe? No, I mean, a cinema was a cinema to an 11 year old. You didn't really pay much attention to architecture or processes. Um, and I used to go an awful lot because it's a great time for musicals and things like that in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So any U film, because father would be inf uh, informed, we had a, like a publicity sheet listing for the month, probably, or week by week of what was going to be on at the cinema. And I loved going to the cinema with, with or without friends. It didn't bother me. And so um, he used to look for, um, then they had X-rated films, which of course was a no-no. <laughs> A-rated films, which you had to have an adult with you, and I didn't want that. <laughs> so I was limited to the U films, mm -hmm. um, which were for any age group could go and watch it unaccompanied. Un 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 and uh, so I used to go and watch as many of those films as I possibly could as they'd let me go and watch. So there was loads of musical films on then. They had a lot of choice because when you've got a barracks with a pile of young men in with mostly national service, who've got basically nothing to do after they finish whatever they're supposed to do during the day. Um, well, they want entertainment at night and they, they didn't have a lot of money either. I mean, you know, the pay was very poor then national service pay um, and you could only have a certain amount in Deutschmarks. There was, we've done a bit of research and uh, my sister particularly has done it for me um, and I, it brings back a lot of memories in that my officers were paid monthly into their bank in Britain. We weren't allowed to have bank accounts in Germany in those days. Um, the, but the soldiers got paid in um, a weekly in cash, but only a certain amount was allowed in Deutschmarks. The rest was in this currency that we used in the nafe at the cinema, and um, so uh, we used to use that as well. Obviously, we'd, we'd just be given that, and we'd go along and, and just buy our tickets and go in. Um, so you would use this um, special currency, Elizabeth, to go into was, the cinema? Yes, it would have been. Okay. What it was, apparently, it was because there was, because both Germany and Britain were so in debt at the end of the Second World War, um, the, there were such tight controls on, uh, on money, and you couldn't take more than, I think it was like five or ten pounds out of the country. It was all written in the back of your passport how much money you were taking out of the country um, in, in hard cash, I mean, now. Um, you couldn't, um, and there was, they were obviously worried about black market because the NAFIs probably sold a lot of things you couldn't at that time buy in Germany. So they were trying to clamp down on any in misuse with black market and things like that. So they were very, very strict about uh, who had what money and how much they had. Talking of this money, Elizabeth, do you actually remember going uh, into the cinema and, and, and buying the ticket and how all of that worked? You know, once you bought a ticket, where did you go? Where did you sit? What did you see? Always went into the cinema, uh, well, buy your ticket at the ticket office. And um, there were usually German people who worked in them, in the cinemas, as far as I can remember. And... Um, and then you went to the usherette who took you up to your tickets and then took you in with the torch because it was always dark in the cinema. It was never lit. Um, and then she just looked for spaces wherever you could sit if there were spaces. If there was a pile of children together, then they'd try and they'd even tell some of the soldiers, you move up there and then these kids can sit on the end, you know. <laughs> And how did that feel, Elizabeth, going into a, a room, presumably with a, a ton of you know, young men, soldiers. Um, how was this for a, a, a young child such as yourself? 
Well, I never, never ever thought or felt intimidated in any way. They were all very, very good. They were very kind. And I mean, they probably missed their little brothers and sisters at home and were feeling a bit homesick. So they probably quite liked having a few kids around the place. It made them feel at home. <laughs> And in terms of the makeup of the audience, can, can you remember were, were there actually you know, older women in the audience, like, like mothers, for instance, would they go? Or, or uh, was it just well, yes. sort of mainly men? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Because not many women, particularly army wives, were working. So if it was a weekend and uh, we'd either go with friends or if it was something in the evening, perhaps one evening, then you know your mum would take you, perhaps. It depended how late it was, because bedtimes were pretty strict mm. so it was usually the weekend when we went and can you remember your mum taking you said before that you, you remember going with friends or you remember going on your own did your mum ever take you to the cinema? I don't remember her taking me now I don't think she was that okay. interested in cinema to be honest <laughs> uh, <laughs> father was more interested than her yes did, did dad take you he might have I remember going to see for instance the robe which was very quite a religious thing, wasn't it? And yeah. then there was the Ten Commandments. Right, okay. I think, I think that was... It. So he probably taught me to see those because he'd want to go and talk about it or something like make sure that he was up to date with what was coming out of Hollywood for... Um, yes. And recalling uh, the auditorium once again, would, would your dad, would others go in uniforms or would they all be wearing their civilian clothing? No, no, they'd all be in uniform. There was very, we all have very few clothes, to be honest. I mean, I had school uniform, play clothes and Sunday clothes. That was about it. So the soldiers were the similar there and they, they didn't have in, they weren't paid enough to do, to shop for clothes. Um, so it was all quite austere in the fifties for mm. everybody. Um, and, and basically they, we did clothes shopping when we came back to Britain. Okay. And, uh, Th thinking about the actual function and, and purpose of this building, the Globe in Oldenburg, other than films, Elizabeth, can you actually remember any other functions or events that, that the Globe may have put on, be it for the children or be it for the soldiers? I don't remember as a child seeing anything else in the cinema. They may well have used it for that purpose, but for perhaps for soldiers, they may, whether they had like visiting lectures and things like that might have gone in. Uh, they may have had that, but it certainly wasn't for us children. Um, and any other sort of, um, the, because the school had a had a stage and things, so you know all those sort of productions were put on at school. Anything that children did. And now that you have a primary school, that will make logical sense to to put it on in that in that space. Um, one question that I ask all service personnel, and you, you, you kind of touched on, upon it, uh, Elizabeth, is with regards to the payment of soldiers. Obviously, payment is not very high, particularly if you're a national service personnel. But one thing that comes up in many of the interviews that I've done is, is the factor of cigarettes, of smoking. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> that was part payment. <laughs> yes, they used to get, that was part of their pay, was a certain ration of cigarettes. Yes. And of course, you could smoke anywhere there. And I mean, you were lucky if you could see the film for the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. So, so you actually think, because a lot of service personnel, they, they question whether they, you know, smoked. I mean, looking at the interviews we've already done, which are readily available online. But um, do you think that, um, you know, smoking was allowed in that cinema? Did you come out of that cinema with your, you know, your clothes smelling? Oh, yes. Smoking was allowed everywhere, John. There was okay. nowhere that was um, where you weren't allowed to. I mean, uh, I've, I've, I've been I've walked into classrooms, not during lessons, but if I walked into a classroom, any, any school, in the, in the off time when they're supposed to be clearing up or something like that, then invariably the teacher would have a cigarette and light. Invariably. <laughs> how, how times have changed. Absolutely. How times yes. have changed. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth, um, we're coming to the end of our interview. I'm going to ask uh, Eula and Freda, do you have any, any further questions that you'd like to ask uh, Elizabeth as she's here in our interview recording now? I think I've asked everything I could think of. I'd like to ask many more questions, but not concerning Oldenburg or the school. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll we'll have... until you come here and visit. Okay, 
It's a deal. <laughs> All right. Uh, to, to, to round off, uh, Elizabeth, obviously you, you've heard about the, the IGES um, Flirtenteich, which is part of the community where the globe is located. And I know that there's a lot of conversations going on at the moment between the IGES Flirtenteich, which was, of course, the, the site of the Oldenburg Primary School that you went to in January 1957. A lot of conversations with the, with the Globe and, and working together, particularly on youth uh, projects, to, to bring uh, the school together with this uh, theatre and uh, cinema trust. Uh, what do you think to this restoration project of the Globe Kulturgenossenschaft, to use the, the German, the Globe uh, Cinema and Theatre Trust in rescuing the cinema, in saving the cinema and bringing it back to life? Well, there's been a few independent cinemas have been brought back to life in Britain. And they, because they're independent, they, they can... Um, they can they can put on live performances from theatres and uh, that are going on in the West End or we have one in Prasati not far from here okay. um, where we can go and see anything that's more or less as is being produced on the on the stage somewhere in, in Britain um, at certain times so they're much freer in other words and uh, and can can pick and choose what they want to do whether this particular cinema was it is it architecturally um, beautiful yeah, from the outside, it's it's very unsuspecting. But if you go in, it, it's yes. like going into a time machine and going back to nineteen fifties Britain. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And and um, has it all been renovated since then inside? Has it That's been... currently ongoing, uh, Elizabeth. So the, uh, the the money's been raised. The the Globe Cinema has been saved. And now the all important work of what is a listed building uh, will yes. now get underway. Obviously, there have been various delays with regards to the coronavirus, yes. but also with yes. regards to you know getting the administration, yes. the administrative side of things sorted out. But yes. it, it will be um, renovated in due course. One of the first things that needs to be done is the, the roofing. Uh, the actual roof needs to be replaced. Yes. Um, but that that's going to happen uh, shortly, and uh, within a couple of years. Uh, perhaps when you do come back and, and the globe is open, you can take yes. another trip back down memory lane and, and visit uh, yes, the, uh, the globe cinema. Absolutely, because I'm all for these independent cinemas. They do an awful lot in that way. And also, I mean, I've belonged to a drama group for years and we've put on uh, productions there. They have only, they've got two cinemas, that's all. But, uh, and one has movable seating they've had installed in it. It's a very old cinema. But um, they, they turned the main auditorium into two smaller cinemas so they could put on two films, obviously, at the same time. But that's where you can go and, as I say, they do put on live productions as well for local groups because they've got their independence. Yeah, and sure. um, they have their own cafe. They have their own sweet counters where they, and things like that. So, um, and their own bar room, too. It's very, very important. Um, Upstairs, yes. So they, they, their independence means that they're, they're, they're um, really interesting places to look at and to see what's going on there. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share all of our contact details because I know uh, that people listening to this may well want to get in contact with either myself um, doing the research uh, into the Globe Cinema. Uh, could also be uh, getting in contact with Eula, um, but also with Elizabeth. So uh, here are email addresses. So there's myself. You can contact me at the University of Birmingham, j.goodyear at bham.ac.uk. Um, if you want to get in contact with Elizabeth, perhaps you went to school with Elizabeth or you remember Elizabeth, then the address there is ehhughes23 at gmail.com. Uh, Eula Zommerberg's uh, email address there is eulazommersberg at yahoo.de and also the internet site of the school www.igs or egs in German um, hyphen flirtenteich.de and the globe uh, is there in all of its glory at uh, www.globe-oldenborg.de. And if you want to find out more about the uh, project, the research project itself, then the uh, headings there are history, obviously for history, or Forschung for research.
Let me thank from the bottom of my heart, um, Eula and Frida for all of they, they've done to make this yes. uh, interview absolutely possible. And uh, thank uh, also uh, Elizabeth for taking the time to take us through her time here in Germany. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to talk to you, Elizabeth. I think the last word will, will go to you before I round off. Uh, would you like to give a, a message to the, the school children of today at uh, IGS Flirtenteich, at the IGS Flirtenteich, uh, about, it could be about anything, about the future, about their, about their lives, about their careers? Oh, I would always say, uh, follow your heart when it comes to a career. Doesn't matter what mummy and daddy want you to be, <laughs> what you want to be, do is what you want to do, because then you will succeed and you will uh, probably reach heights that you don't dream of. Um, don't let anybody put you down, is another. Always, always be proud of yourself. I think that's a very nice note to end on. So thank you once again to you, to Frida, to you, Elizabeth. Take care, and until next time, when we have someone who was here in the 1950s reflecting on his time mm -hmm. here in Oldenburg. That's it from them and that's yes. it from me. Bye for now. Bye for now. Thank you.